right. So, welcome, 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 welcome. Here we are again, class number two, server-side programming. Um, how is everybody doing today? Good. Wonderful. Um, I heard the weather is supposed to be hot towards the middle of the week, so that'll be nice or not nice, depending on whether you like hot weather. So, um, got lots to get through today. This one's going to be mostly me talking. Um, so, you know, pay attention. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, web application development. Can anybody in the room tell me what is a web application? Yes? Something you can use on a browser? Something you can use on a browser? Yes, the interface to it is a browser. Not always, but it can be. Um, anybody else? What is a web application? Yes? Web application is a software program. Uh, no reading <laughs> from your brain. Come on. Uh, it's a program that allows the user to connect to the internet and. Are you reading from the other screen now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's basically yeah. it. Okay. All right. So, yes. I was gonna say like an app that's on the website that you can access through. Well, I'd say that an like application on your computer. Yeah, so a web application is a specific type of application. We know what applications are. They are programs, yeah. right? The purpose of Web Applications Classic is to present hypertext, right? Hypertext being our general term for web page-like things. Dynamic content, links, lovely things, images, all kinds of lovely hypertext. Structurally, a web application is composed of the server side plus the client side. The combination of these two sides make one web application. So, if anybody on the front end gets all you know, up on their high horse and, let, and they say, oh, there would be no application without me. The server-side programmer has exactly as much right to claim the exact same thing. They are two halves of the same coin. If you can't, you can't think of a coin with only one half, so you can't think of a web application without either one of the, the front or the back end. Right? Another way of thinking of it is it's, a, it's an application whose processes and resources are connected through a network. Right? Good. So far, so good. So, so does anybody uh, know, has anybody uh, heard of or used REST? full or REST APIs. So, does anybody know what an API is? Application programming interface? Application programming interface. Does anybody know what an API is used for? Isn't it like pinging a database? Just ping a database to like retrieve information from a database? That's a common use of it in a web application. But API is actually a very general term. It can mean anything from a RESTful API in a web application all the way down to 
the methods that a Java class presents are its API. Application programming, like in terms of like the semantic contents of words in that acronym, pretty much any piece of software is an application. So the A we can safely remove. You're going to be using it for programming, but we are programmers, so you can remove the P. We are really just left with the I, which is interface. Anytime we are talking about an interface, we can probably call it an, an, an API, right? So, web APIs allow an interface to remote resources. These are the cornerstone on which cloud technology has been constructed, right? So, let's take an example. Um, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter. Twitter has, or X, X, X now, Twitter used to be. Um, the social media platform X has a web API which you can use to post tweets. Wow, okay. Are they still called tweets? I think they're posts yeah. now. Are they posts now? You can just call it Twitter. Let's yeah, call it we can just call it, call it. Okay. It's easier. Yeah, okay. Sorry, Mr. Musk, but you're stupid. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, your naming convention is stupid. I'm sure you have, you're, you're, you're an intelligent person. But you, you made a bad decision. Um, you know, well, you can be intelligent and still be evil, right? You know. I'm not saying that you're evil, Mr. Musk. I'm recording right now. Anyway. Um, so. Hands up at your door the next day. What was I talking about? Oh, yes, Twitter. So, Twitter has an exposed API which you can use to write programs to send tweets for you. You can send many, many, many tweets this way. Uh, because a program does not type with fingers and you are not limited by the speed of someone's keyboard, right? But, um, and you know, you could also do fun things like hook up, uh, you know, the API for certain chatbots to the API for Twitter and just write a chatbot that, you know, uses Twitter, which many people have done, um, you know, that kind of stuff. It's an interface where you send some inputs and it performs a process, maybe, perf maybe sends some output. In the case of Twitter, all it's really doing is logging tweets into its big tweet database, right? Now, the fun thing about APIs and the reason that companies like to develop them is that the API actually becomes a service you can charge for. If you take a look at x slash Twitter and their API page, you see, you know, you get X number of these things per day per free, uh, for free, and then after that, you gotta pay for it, right? And you can buy tiers of subscription to the thing to be able to blast out, you know, 10 million tweets a day, which I don't know why, you know, I know I would unsubscribe, but, um, you know, so APIs become a product which the company sells to other developers who want to use their API to do stuff, right? All of this is possible in the PHP that we are going to be learning this semester. Make sense? So far so good? Good. So. <clears throat> Um, just on that previous topic, um, who here has heard of Amazon Web Services? Yeah. So Amazon Web Services is a really, like, one of the main, major three or four cloud service providers. And that's basically their entire business model for that side is, you know, provide an API and ch charge people for their usage of it. Um, did you folk know that uh, Amazon actually makes more money on its on Amazon Web Services than it does on selling things? Yeah, it's really big, uh, big money. 
It's crazy, right? That's probably where all the free shipping comes from. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so let us now talk about stacks and developers. So, front end stack and back end stack are the client side and the server side. Front end developer is a job description. Backend developer, likewise, is a job description. The intent of this program is to make all of you into full stack developers, which means that you are capable of doing both, even if most of the time you're doing one or the other. So with front end versus back end versus full stack, it really depends on the company that you are employed with, what your duties will involve. If you're working for a smaller company, uh, you know, for example, you might have, you know, the precision, precision spring company that manufactures springs. They decide they need a website, but they're not specialists in, you know, they're a manufacturer of actual physical objects. They don't have, you know, web capabilities on their staff. What they will often do is hire a single developer who will develop a web page for their company and um, in that situation, you're most likely to be a full stack developer. You're not working with anybody else. You will, you will be responsible for everything, right? The larger the team gets, the more likely it is that you are, your job duties will be split between front end or back end, right? Does that make sense to you? Make sense, right? Um, because when multiple software people are working on a project together, the thing that you have to decide is how you're going to uh, divide the labor, right? Um, ideally, you divide the labor in such a way that two, two people aren't working on the same set of files, right? If two people are working on the same set of files, then they might be making overlapping overwrites to each other's work. Um, you have to be very careful about managing uh, who gets permission to write when and that type of thing. And things have become a lot easier since the in invention of repositories uh, and versioning, version control software, um, but still kind of a pain, right? It's much easier if, you know, you work on these three files, work on those three files, I'll work on these three files, type thing. And one of the obvious lines that you divide along first is between front and back end, since those are, you know, they're not only different environments, but like, they're running, like, the front end developer doesn't even, like, need XAMPP installed or anything to do most of the work they do, right? Um, so, does that make sense? So, what is the front stack? Well, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and whatever front-end framework you might be using. Um, such as React, Angular, Vue.js, or um, in JavaScript you folks used Bootstrap. Uh, Bootstrap is a front-end framework. Make sense? So, when we say framework, we don't necessarily mean like some kind of monolithic piece of software that's like its own application. Sometimes they look like that. Sometimes it's as easy as like, oh, this thing just like provides a whole bunch of CSS classes which I'm going to use, right? Sometimes it integrates like that. Um, yeah. Making sense? Question? I don't mean to get into the nuances of things, and like I know people have their own opinions, but isn't there like some truth to the different types of stacks, like Run stack, stack, web stack? Like, if we're learning PHP, can we use that with JavaScript? Would that even make sense? So, um, 
parts of this class, so the question in general is, um, isn't there some degree of truth in each of the uh, each of the development stacks? And you're talking backend stacks, right? Uh, actually, if we scroll down a little bit, we've actually got like we're talking about like Mern and Mean and Lamp down here, right? So, and we're teaching Lamp here. Um, isn't there like utility in each one of these? Right? So. The way to think about it is this. Um, basically, there are four major functions in backend development that you need to pick a technology for. Right? You need some kind of operating system, or uh, what is it? Yeah, you'll need a database, database here. You'll need a <laughs> scripting language. You'll need an operating system, and you'll need a um, Like, um, what's the word I want for it? Like a, a framework, I guess. So, if you choose Linux, Apache, um, MySQL, and PHP, that's L A M P. You end up with the lamp stack, right? If you choose what? Come on! I don't know. I don't know who did that. If that was a prank, but that was a genius prank. Genius. Do I even have one in this room, though? This might be a problem. Uh oh, all right. Um. There it is. If, for example, you choose um, Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node, right? They kind of They'll swap the orders of these around in order to make it like a word that you can say, right? But it's Mango, Express, Angular, and Node.js. That gives you mean and then, you know. So the question is like, can you swap one of these out? And yes, absolutely. So for example, if you swap out Angular for React, right? Swap out that, put an R in, you turn mean into mer, right? In theory, you know, if you've designed your software well and it's been well modularized and all of that, there should be not too much difference in the uh, M, E, and N sections uh, of that conversion. Your, this is going to change substantially, obviously, because you're moving from one framework to another. But um, yeah, the rest of that should remain relatively stable. So yeah, you can mix and match, but you know, you ca like if you imagine that there are like twenty different options for each one of these letters, then you know you have you know twenty times twenty times twenty times twenty as the possible number of stacks, which is you know. That's too many to know, right? People will stick to like a common set of them, and as a developer, 
what will most likely have end up happening is you will specialize in one or two development stacks. And you will seek out job applications that say, I am looking for a LAMP developer, I am looking for a MERN developer. Uh, when a company says that, they don't want you to, uh, they don't want to have to train you on the stack that they're hiring for. So right? you learn what, you're not pigeonholing yourself from... Well, I mean, you are to an extent, right? Because um, the more you use a particular one, the better you get at it, the more likely you are to get work for that stamp, for that stack, right? Like, the experience you have, uh, the stack you have experience in is relevant to the jobs you get. The more experience you have in LAMP, the more LAMP jobs you'll get, type thing, right? So to an extent, you are making a, a decision, you are to some degree pigeonholing yourself, and what I'm here to tell you is, don't be afraid of that, because that's how you make money. <laughs> right? Like, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be a student for the rest of your life. Um, it is always good to be learning new technologies and to be updating your skills, but um, there's, this kind of, there's a trap that a lot of young people fall into in this respect, where, like, um, you're always learning some new thing. So you never spend long enough on any specific island to really get used to life there, right? Um, you're kind of doing this island hopping all the time from technology to technology. So you have like a good overview of all of the different technologies out there in the field, but you haven't become a really like fast and efficient developer on any one of them, right? And that's not, use, that's not as useful to get you into like a senior developer role for example. Um, and I think the second part of your question was, so what about like this course? Is this course going to help me, you know, get into a MERN stack or something like that? So the content in this course is like we'll have programming bits and then we'll have lovely discussions like this, right? The programming bits will be certainly PHP specific. I am trying to teach you guys PHP. The more talking bits like this are applicable no matter what stack you're talking about. Like it doesn't matter what stack you're using, you still need to you, you still need to avoid cross-site scripting attacks. And a cross-site scripting scripting attack will occur in the same like using the same vector no matter what the back end is running, right? It's, it's attacking through the same channel, right? So if you know how it works on, on LAMP, then you know how it works everywhere else. Um, further, like, it doesn't matter which, uh, it doesn't matter what stack you're using. Fundamentally, the I and the O of a server are the same, right? You are still receiving request packets, and you are still producing response packets, right? So knowing how to work with packets also is very um, cross-platform, shall we say. Does that make sense? Any other questions following on from that? Okay. So. So, um, I'm about to say some things to you which hopefully you listen to, because if you do, you could save yourself months and or years of effort over your lifespan as a software developer. We are going to talk a little bit about the software development life cycle. So, software development life cycles are a topic of study in software development. Um, they evolve over time. In the early days, there was a very unstructured approach to software development. This resulted in um, many, many programs that were completely undiscernible to anybody but the person who wrote them, uh, and only then within three months of having written it. Obviously, this isn't the, this isn't the best state of affairs if you're 
trying to do maintainability or work with other people. Uh, back then, most projects were single-person projects. A person, you know, many of the Atari games for the Atari 2600 were like plunked out by one guy in like two or three weeks. That's why the, yeah, the the crash happened. But um, in modern software development, there are steps you follow to make sure that your project doesn't go completely outside scope, right? I know we're all software developers here. I know we all have introverted tendencies. But you must talk to the customers. I know they're humans, and as introverts, we're kind of iffy on humans, you know? Not the best people we've ever met, human beings. But you must talk to the customers, right? If you engage the customer in conversation, you will find out what they expect of you for a project. You will expect, like, the scope of work as you see it must, in the, at the end of the define phase, match up as perfectly as possible with the scope of work as they see it. And if you're smart, you'll put that down in writing. Right? Customers are normally non-technical people. Right? Non-technical people really have no idea whatsoever about software, how difficult it is to develop, how long it takes to develop, what it should cost. There are many things which, to put them, you know, to put it another way, uh, there are many things which a normie will think about software that uh, will think are, is easy about a software project that you as a soft, actual software person will think, well, that will take me literally months and months and months to do, if it's possible at all. Um, and conversely, normies will often think things are, some things are very difficult, which are actually quite easy. So they don't really, yeah, exactly, they don't understand the discipline, they don't understand where the difficulties lie in software development, because they're not software developers. Question. I was going to say, but vice versa also. People mm -hmm. will say, oh, can you make an app for me? I have a good idea. And you're like, do you know how long that's going to take? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm saying. Like, um, I have, uh, I have an, a slightly amusing anecdote from my own personal life. Um, so, at one point, I was approached by a fellow who, um, who draws for, composes, writes um, a comic book up north, I think in like North Bay, he was, he was stationed. Um, and this person wanted a collectible card uh, game app for phones for their comic book characters. And, you know, I said, okay, well, you know, I could do you a very quick demo for X amount of money. You could use that for like a Kickstarter or something so that you can get fund the development and then we can talk about how much money that might make and how much development that would, that would buy you and like we can talk about features and that sort of thing. And um, this guy who did not really have an appreciation for what he was asking for said, oh, I, 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 thought, I thought that you could do it pro bono and I said, Goodbye. Um, like, but like when you're talking about artists, like there's this really awful thing among visual artists where often they will work for exposure, right? Um, and this person, like I don't even necessarily blame this person for this because like that's how he was viewing what we do, right? Um, oh, programmers work for exposure, right? you shouldn't work for exposure, you should be paid for what you do. Um, when you work for free, it, lo it, it lowers everybody else's wages too, right? 
Um, solidarity. All right? Don't work for free because, like actually literally though, right? Like if somebody's giving it away for free, that means that you have to start giving it away for free too. This is actually kind of what's happened to like indie games. Uh, even it's crept into Steam, you know? Like it's really, really hard to charge money for an indie game unless it's like something really famous now. Like even on, some, you know, even on a platform like Steam, the successful ones are all giving it away for free. And you know, there used to be platform solidarity on Steam that you could, you, you know, two bucks wasn't an unreasonable ask for a video game. But these days, you know, it's all, it's all out, it's all out flapping in the wind. But, um, but yeah, so, yeah, you're, you, when you work, you should expect to be paid for it. Um, you do not owe anybody a lifetime of uh, software maintenance just because you wrote them a website one time, right? Maintenance is an ongoing cost. There should be a maintenance contract, right? Is this making sense? Yeah. When you decide what the scope of work is, you need to decide, you need to put a very firm boundary around it, right? This is what you are contracting me to do. These are the features you have asked for. Anything, any features outside of this scope of work are going to be extra money. Any changes to this scope of work is going to be extra money. Because one of the things that non-technical pe non people often underestimate is the amount of time and uh, the amount of effort and time it is to just do a small change. Just fix this thing, just do that, just do this other thing. Oh, people don't seem to like this feature. Could you just tweak it this way? It's like you can, you can die, you can die of a thousand cuts that way. And also on the subject of, of working for exposure, you do know that people die of exposure, right? Yeah, precisely. So, um, yeah, like, these are skills that are worth money. You know, we are not, we're not sent, trying to send you out to the world to make no money. You should expect to be fairly compensated for your work. Like, you know, you should have that much self-respect, you know? But anyway. So, but it's very, 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 very important to nail down scope of work, right? And nail it down as early as possible in the process before you start designing anything. Um, like, you know, I did a PhD. That PhD was a software project. It took me way too long to do my PhD. And the reason it took me way too long is because my supervisor kept coming back to me with scope creep. The term is scope creep. It's like, Oh, could you just do this next thing? Oh, could you just do this next thing? It's like, well, I was supposed to be graduated three years ago. And eventually, you just get tired of it and say, listen, either, either this stops or I quit. Right? So, like, you can find work. Don't worry. Like, once you start getting work, you won't have, you'll have too much of it, you know, if you're good anyway. Um, so, you know, protect yourselves out there because people want stuff out of you and you know you need to be fairly cons compensated and given circumstances that you know you're not giving away more than than you have contracted basically does that make sense i'm telling you this because i love you you know and i don't want not in that sense um, I'm telling you this because I have fraternal love for you, and I want you all to do well in your careers, and if you don't follow this advice, if nothing else, you're in for some rough, you're in for rough times, okay? So, <clears throat> so, once you have established the bounds of the work which you are to perform. The next thing that you do is design. Design before you implement. So, everybody remembers Java? Everybody remembers the UML class diagrams from Java? Now, 
to be completely honest, how many people did your UML before you did your implementation? How many people did your implementation and then did your UML afterwards? Yeah. <laughs> Both at the same mode. time? I ended up adding things yeah. afterwards to the UML. Like well, let's start with it. Like, that's okay. actually fine, right? Like, um, like it's, it's okay to write up a design and then during implementation you must refine the design and then you reflect that in your, in your design document. That's actually good software practice because it means that you're responsive to the ongoing situation of development, right? And that you're keeping your documentation up to date. That's actually fine. That's good. Um, but what's not so great is to start programming before you have a clear concept of what it is you're actually doing, right? The whole purpose of the design work is to figure out what is it that I'm actually doing, how long is it going to take, how many classes do I need, how many API calls am I, am I supporting, all of this kind of stuff. Now this takes a, an even more important aspect once you're talking about APIs and web applications. Part of your design work will be deciding on what the interface looks like between the server and the client. Or if you're designing a web API, what that exposed API looks like. The interface between two areas of software should be viewed as a contract between the people working on those areas. The front-end developer should not be able to push you around and say, oh, well, I thought it'd be nice to have this kind of Ajax call be made over here, so support it, please. Not in the design document. If you want that, it's going to be time and money, and I think our boss should talk. We should, should, we should ask our boss whether he's willing to uh, to invest in your convenience as the front-end developer, right? Mm -hmm. The API is the interface through which these two pieces of software communicate. If you nail that down ahead of time and say, these are the calls that we need, this, you know, if you give me this input, I will give you that output, or this, 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 and this, simplifies things tremendously. You can just go ahead with your work. You don't have to actually worry how far ahead, how far along the client, the, or the, uh, the front end developer is with his or her work, right? You don't have to worry about how far or along they are, and you know whether their um, whether their prototype is ready to be sending the uh, sending the packets yet or anything like that. You just go ahead and develop it, right? Because you've already decided what they should be sending you. And if they ever send you anything else, they get not a teapot. That's a internet return code. Okay, I'll show you. send to the client when the client makes a bad request. 400 is just like your general one. 401 is unauthorized. 402, payment required. 403, or if the client does not have a sufficient level of access to access the thing they're trying to access. Everybody knows 404. I'm sure you got plenty of them when you were doing JavaScript. 404, resource not found. You are requesting something that doesn't exist. It's a, uh, you have more and more and more and more and more.
And then you have my very favorite internet error code 418, I'm a teapot. The server refuses to the attempt to brew coffee with the teapot. This is your error code. You are asking me to do something that I am not designed to do. Right? Or, you know, just to mess with people. I think just to mess with people is also valid. Hmm? How do you get that error? Um, I've never actually encountered one in the wild. I've never seen one, though. Yeah, but, um, There's actually this cool web API where you can like, you can um, you can send an internet error code and it will give you like a picture of a kitten corresponding to the error code that you got. But yeah, yeah, I've never got a 418 myself, but then again, that's like probably something that someone would do during development rather than you know exposed to a customer, shall we say. Making sense? Good. So, um, so when you perform your initial development work, do you do it on the final server, the release server? Initial development on the uh, production server? No, absolutely not. Uh, anything that's on the production server is viewable to the general internet, plus your customers. You don't put broken, uh, broken versions of your web page that are literally actually like, you know, embedding PHP syntax errors into your web content. You don't show that to normies, right? They don't know what to do with that. They're just going to complain to your boss, so don't do it. The development should occur in a local context. So for us, because we're working on things individually, that means your development occurs on XAMPP, right? A local contained environment. You can do whatever you want on it. You can develop as much as you like on it. You can get any kind of crazy error code you want. It doesn't actually, you know, it's never actually viewed by anybody on the greater internet. So you have the grace of just being able to work on something without being interfered with. Um, make sense? It's a little bit of work to set one up, but not that much. And uh, that's where you should do your local development. Once you have done your local development, you test, 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 test. You guys are in a software testing class at the moment, aren't you? Software testing, yeah. Yeah. Um, see that course on testing methodologies. But uh, in general, if you're typing in test cases by hand, you're doing it wrong. You should be running automated testing suites whenever possible. It's not that difficult. All you do is write something that calls your software with multiple inputs, looking for the output, and gives you an error if it mismatched one of your uh, mismatched. If it didn't get what it's expecting, then it just you know gives you a message about it. Failed on this bug. Failed this test. This test case. Once you have tested, tested, tested your implementation, you kick it out to your production server, and then. You test it, test it, test it again. You are testing it again to make sure that the testing environment that you tested it in before accurately, accurately represented the, the, uh, the conditions so that you know, an absence of bugs in your local testing environment also means an absence of bugs in your production server. It's not necessarily the case, right? If you misconfigured your local development environment, you know, it's possible there are bugs 
that don't show up there that will show up on your production server. Not to mention, there are things that will need to be modified about the program uh, versus your local environment. For example, when we write databases, uh, when we interface with databases a bit later in the course, we will, um, we will be using PHP to connect to an SQL database. The PHP needs to have login credentials to the SQL database. Within XAMPP, that has like a default value. I think it's the username is admin and the password is blank or something like that, right? When you go to the production server, do you think the SQL database will have a uh, root accessible user called admin with no password? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Not if you're smart. Um, so, minimally, when you're making that transition, you will have to remove the bit where it's using those login, local login credentials and add the login credentials for the production server's SQL database, right? So that's just an example of one of the sorts of changes that you have to make, and you yourselves will have to make that change when you deploy something to CS Unix for assignment four. I think, yeah, assignment four is the one that uses databases. So, any questions? Setting up a development environment, I will skip. If you're interested, um, in installing it on your own machine, you can follow those instructions. I will just highlight that um, the correct version for PHP on XAMPP is 7.2.24 for this course. That will match it up with CS Unix. Um, so use that version. Um, when you go after the, after the download, for this guy, um, for me at least, it redirected me to Source Forge for the download, and you got this long list of PHP versions. First of all, sort that by number, you know, because it's like by date or something. Um, and when you find the version that you want, like I don't know about you guys, but I was getting like this strange like internet error whenever I tried to do the, the download, and so I found that if you just if you just like spam the click button on like the reload button, eventually you do actually get the download. So yeah, um, yeah. But aside from that, this will be an exercise left to the reader. Yep. That's all information you already have as well. So, <clears throat> and we already did Hello World. now do a comparison between various languages that may be used for server-side development. We will be comparing three of the languages we've learned so far and the one that we are currently learning. So, Recall, on a server, any language may be used. So long as that language has the ability to process packets, it may be used as a server-side scripting language. 
First up, we have snake language. Python. Python is a language which introductory level programmers usually learn in un introductory courses. It's very popular for that. Um, because in theory, it has simplified syntax. Personally, I'm not sure I would consider it to have simplified syntax because you are loading uh, a lot of semantic content into white space, which other languages don't do. Like what Python does, right, is it takes things that are just conventions in other languages and it says, no, you have to do that now, right? Which means that, you know, things like indentation must be strictly followed where they don't in other languages. I, you know, I argue that it's maybe just easier to have an explicit character that opens and closes a code block, but whatever. Um, yeah, with Python, it's like you have intro level programming and artificial intelligence, and like nothing in between. Um, Python can be used with web server frameworks like the Django and Flask, uh, which are popular for web development, particularly if you need anything related to artificial intelligence or machine learning and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, Python also has quite good um, data manipulation libraries, in theory, uh, NumPy and Pandas, although if you actually take a look at most of these things, uh, they are often um, exposed APIs in Python for libraries ultimately written in C++. At least the efficient ones. Um, so, so much for Python. Um, yeah. Java is also used on servers occasionally. Java has good object-oriented uh, constructs. It's highly scalable and reliable, which means that Enterprise applications tend to prefer Java. Sure. Um, incidentally, has anybody actually ever seen the uh, object-oriented capabilities of, uh, of Python? Anybody know how to declare a class? A little bit? Yeah? Yeah. 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 Um, little bit? Do you want to? Are you interested at all? Yeah. You just like class and then your name of the class and then colon. Yeah. And then you can do an init to initiate the class whenever you call it. Yeah. Stuff like that. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do a brief tangent on uh, on Python. <laughs> This thing has just got a, a, a Python interpreter, like just, you know, easily and simply explode, exposed. Hmm? Launch! Come on. You're just giving me more reasons to hate you, Python. So, this is the Python interpreter. They showed you the Python interpreter in, in Python class, right? Yeah. yeah. Good. So, let's define a class. Class, oh, class A, there we go. Now, constructors. 
You remember constructors from Python or from, from Java, right? Yeah. Yeah. Def init cells. So here are some fun things about Python. When you are overloading a, uh, a definition provided by um, you know object in Python, it must be it must be bracketed by two underscore characters. So init is the constructor. There you go. Also, all methods in Python classes, the first argument to them is the is a name for the self-reference. So the reference to the object on which the method is called must be passed as a parameter. That's stupid. Come on. Right? What's going on with that? Come on. Come on. Right? So we're off to a great start. Now, here's a question. Does anybody know how to do private and public in Python? That was a fairly important topic in Java, right? Private versus public. It would make sense that Python did something like that, right? Uh, it does. It does, in theory. So, this is how you declare a variable. So, you use self.x, right? You have to do self every time this binds it to the scope of the class instead of the scope of the uh, it, yeah, instead yeah, of the scope yeah, of the, uh, the method but you have to do that every time so self this is the private one that's public this is private Oh, oh, I love those those cries of instant revulsion uh, yeah uh, uh, that, uh, yeah yeah, that's how you do private. In, that's a private variable in Python. You know what the best part is, though? Is there a best part? Even though they're private, right? Don't steal my thunder. Uh, I know, because I... <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually. Yeah, I'll show them how. Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> so, here's the thing, though, right? That's part of the name. You have to use that every time you use the variable. Yes. Every single time. Every single time. It's kind of lame. It is kind of lame. It's terrible, right? So. It's ugly. But that's not even the best part. All right. So. All right. So we have our class. Let's make an object. <laughs> Let's make an object Bob of class A accessing Bob.x. Okay, sure. Everything works. Bob.y attribute error attribute error. A object has no attribute Y. Fair enough. That's actually true. Because it was called. The actual name is underscore underscore y. Oh! Object A has no attribute underscore underscore y. Now, if I were a proper programming language, I might produce something resembling an access violation error rather than just pretending it didn't exist. Right? But this is Python. And Python will be Python. So, but it gets even better. All right? All objects in Python have a publicly accessible attribute called dict, bracketed, bracketed by underscores. Let's take a look at the contents of that nice little piece of loveliness. Underscore, underscore. B I C T. Enter. Hmm. Ah, what's the 
So, I'll scroll it up a little bit and blow out. Alright, can I scroll it up? Oh. There we go. And that's a little bit bigger. So, we have a single underscore, the name of the class, two underscores, and then the name of the private variable. That is the name. Is it so blob dot that would work, but Well, let's see. Let's see. Bob dot underscore a underscore a underscore underscore y is equal to uh, Python is literal literally close language as Oh look, no errors. What do you know? Because you said it yet. I'm telling you. That's what it's like. Yeah, that's what it's like. All you need to know is the class name. And you can read the class name from the object very easily by calling type. Type of Bob is class name. There you go. I could just use making machines up there and call it dip, right? Well, yeah, but yeah, since this is just a dictionary, you could also just loop over it. Yeah, you could just find it and find it. Yeah. Find something and be like, oh, okay, that's what it is. Yeah. That's super, like, secure, right? <laughs> that's super secure. <laughs> now, like, so when people say that Python has private, like Python is object oriented, I'm like object oriented, <laughs> um, and it's it's actually very interesting when you present a Python enthusiast and oh man, Python enthusiasts. <laughs> Um, you know I know a few, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, when you present a Python enthusiast with the fact that all Python is doing to provide private variable na private variables is it's just name mangling with the class name and not even like encrypting anything or anything. It's just right there. Yeah. Like, here's the thing about this, right? If it were at least picking some kind of random string here, you wouldn't be able to guess this, right? And it would be, it would be like, fine. That would actually be a fine way of doing it in the back end if this were something random. But it's not. It was a decision to do this. Right? But when you, when you talk to a Python enthusiast and you provide them with this evidence of Python's suckiness, you know what their normal default response to that is? <laughs> Can anybody guess what a Python enthusiast's normal response to that is? Tell you to use Java or something. Hmm? They'll just tell you to use Java. No. Uh, well, it's got a standard library for everything. I don't know. No, the, well. <laughs> yeah. Do they say something like, oh, but then they'll actually check the dictionary or anything, or don't they actually look there? Nope. May well, the one that I usually get is, well, why do you need private anyway? Right? See, I would have, I would have just said that Python has like a standard library for like yeah. everything, pretty much. Yeah, well, no, like, see, there are reasons to use Python. Like, I hate on Python, but I do use Python for stuff, right? Like, normally what I use Python for is, like, if I need, like, if I need to format a CSV file or something like that, like, it's, it's a nice language because you can, like, you can whip something up in 15, 20 lines and it just, you know, it does its thing, you know? But, like, to imagine it as a substitute for Java, yeah, no. It's too slow, anyway. Yes, that's the other thing, yeah. It's all interpreted. Well, I actually, I had a student once who was using, uh, using Python for image processing, took the exact same code, 
transliterated it into C++ <laughs> oh, yeah, miles fast. wasn't twice as fast. It's like hundreds. It wasn't three times as fast. It wasn't four times as fast. It was five times faster. Same algorithm, just in a better language. And C++ is a difficult language, but it's a good language. Um, as people who want jobs, it is a good thing to learn a difficult skill that is rare. That's like a good tip for job security, right? Like, take for example the opposite of an end of the spectrum. Imagine you just knew HTML, right? Any, everybody and their monkey knows HTML. Arts students can be trained to use HTML, for Pete's sake. You know? Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. 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 So, like, yeah, if you're competing in your job with art students, you know. Yes? I was wondering, like, for some of those, like, more intensive, like, data libraries, like, mm -hmm. like, uh, like, Tencent, like, uh, yeah, Pandas, Monkey, and Tencent, right? Mm -hmm. Like, can they use those in, like, different languages? Or are they just, are they just, like, I mean, I know you said that Pandas numbers are, like, plus, 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 yeah, also, like a lot of the machine learning stuff too is actually in the back end C++ libraries with an exposed Python interface. Yeah, the, the, uh, the secret is, the secret is getting out. Um, you can call a C++ function from any language. Yeah. So in C, like in C and C, in the C C++ ecosystem, um, like and this kind of gets into like what a DLL is. Uh, so a DLL is dynamically linked library, right? So all you do is you take a C++ program, you compile it to a dynamically linked library, and then other things can link to it, and other programming languages can link to it. And like, you don't have, like, the DLL can be highly optimized C++ code, but it could be, you know, run on, run by Python on the front end, you never know the difference. But it is actually written in, you know, something fast and efficient. Because people don't like C++. Because, <laughs> as I said, C++ is a hard language for it. Um, interesting thing about C and C++, did you know that, um, C is actually a proper subset of C++. It uses the same compiler, right? Yeah. So like all C programs are C++ programs, but not all C++ programs are C programs. No, because in TypeScript, TypeScript compiles to JavaScript, right? Um, if you have a C++ file, if you throw it into the C compiler, so long as it doesn't contain any C++ elements, it will compile in the C compiler. Yeah. Which is, you know, kind of cool. It's like C++ is actually a language has, that has been physically built on top of the other language. Which is why, if you're going to learn C++, you should start by learning C. Right? No, they took C out of the program. Uh, a, a number of years back, actually. Much to my chagrin, as it is my favorite language to teach. But, uh... Oh, why, did hmm? why did they take it um, Well, because uh, there are basically no jobs in it. Uh, um, even, like, even C++, like, like, you have to understand that this is college, man. This is education for the masses. Right? The college is going to target, um, the college is going to try to get the most jobs for the most students. That means covering the popular languages in terms of what is actually in demand in the market. Were you teaching it at Mac? I was teaching C at Mac, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I taught C a number, for a number of years at, uh, at McMaster um, because C is actually still used. Um, well, first of all, if you're going to study like how memory works. Yes. You have to know how C works. Well, and CS50 begins, you know CS50, right? Mm. They begin teaching C because you have to tell the computer 
how much memory you're going to be taking up. Exactly. Data, like everything up front. Like C is an interesting language. It doesn't really have data types. Like the only way, like, because everything is just binary data to C. What it has is like this variable occupies n bits. And so long as two variables occupy the same number of bits, you can actually use them interchangeably with each other. Like you just interpret the variable as a you know as a float if you want a float, or as an integer if you want an integer. Of course, this is how a lot of students run into like really garbled uh, error messages, right? But it's interesting that it does that. But you say it's so important, and yet there's no jobs in it. Well. C, like it's important if you're going to learn C++, and there are like there are jobs for C++. Mm -hmm. Like the scripting language for Unreal Engine is C++. Interestingly okay. about that, they yeah. uh, um, I program games in Unreal, and it's entirely been changed to Blueprint Visual Scripting. Oh, so as an app. Well, you can do it in C++. Yeah. But if you understand how the code works, you can visual script it. That's what I've been doing. Yeah, not once have I, have I touched a line of C++ because I scarred myself with it. Uh, I took a program, I took a class outside of school in grade 11. Mm -hmm. They taught us how to make a game engine in C++. Let's say those days were not fun for me. I, it's a hard language. It is very hard and I yeah. was not taught C. So uh, they were like, all right. Like you can't just be like you can't just be dropped in with no introduction to pointers. Yeah. It's still on my <laughs> GitHub repository, and yeah, it is it's it's rough. Yeah, well, so not what you would use for a server then. No. Yeah. Segue back into the material. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So JavaScript. Um, Another awful language that you could put on your server if you really want to. Um, anybody care to guess why I think uh, JavaScript is awful? I, I just have a feeling you hate all like dynamic languages. Yeah, the, it, yeah, they pretty much all inter. Yeah. yeah, that is that is pretty much the divide. Anything compiled <laughs> is lovely. Anything yeah. interpreted I can, is. I can understand just, that. I understand. Um, yeah, but it's it mostly it's the type system. Yeah. Yeah, I sometimes joke with students. I say, um, Java, in JavaScript, there's really only one type, and it's stupid. You know? Which is kind of true, actually. Like the way that di then the way that weak typing works, like everything is kind of in one bucket and always being always compared to everything in that bucket by default. And you know, if they don't give me a name for it, I could just call it stupid. So um, yeah. Um, the thought of picking any one of these is too unbearable. Just put me down as undecided. Every language is terrible. Um, yeah, so JavaScript, if you want to use Node.js, like, JavaScript is like, I guess you can make an argument for it if you want to unify the language that's being used across the front and the back ends. You know, um, but anybody who's, you know, a proper programmer shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be dismayed by the fact that you're expected to use more than one different language, you know. Um, JavaScript has seen quite a lot of development recently to make it better, but it, you know, it's still got a ways to go, and there are fundamental things about the language that are just broken in my view. Yes? This is not really a question, I just want to see your thought on this, but like my wife works for a company where they use uh, JavaScript on the front end and Rust in the back end. Sweet. Is that good? <laughs> Rust is an interesting one. Um, so if you're not familiar with what, like if, if you guys, if there are, anybody, anybody, any Rust stations in the, in the crowd? No? You know what like the, the selling point for Rust is as a language? I hear it's very memory safe. Yeah. So. It claims to have a systems level programming language performance, yeah. so comparable to C, C++, but with pointers that are checked. Uh, like it checks to make sure that the pointers are like leading to valid places and that sort of thing. Which is an interesting combination because normally you don't get that without garbage collection. Yeah. Right? Um, so yeah, no, Rust is 
I find the syntax on Rust to be a little bit Weird. obtuse. But um, then again, you know, I've I, I haven't gotten deeply into Rust. I just like tried a few things in it. But uh, yes. Segmentation fault. Which it, you get a lot in C. <laughs> yeah, in C programming, if you have a pointer, like for example, when you initialize a pointer, uh, well, first of all, in C, when you initialize any variable, it doesn't overwrite it like it does in Java and just give you like a default zero. You actually get whatever data was in that memory cell when you declared the variable. So that could be pointing anywhere, right? Most commonly zero, though, which the, when you, so a pointer is a memory address. If you dereference memory address zero, you are asking to read the first, the value in the first cell in memory. The way that operating systems work is they draw a box around the memory that you're allowed to have, and if you try to access any other memory, it kills your program. Because, you know, you might be stupid, you're either stupid or a hacker. And in both cases, you should be shut down. Yeah. Right? But yeah, when, when your program tries to access memory outside of the bounds assigned to it by the operating system, that's called a segmentation fault. And um, uh, let's just say um, a lot of, like, you know the blue screen of death? Oh, yeah. A lot of blue screen of death level errors are things like segmentation faults. But if the program, if the OS is because the segmentation uh, fault occurred in the operating system. Because it's Windows! That's why! Yeah. Sorry, one further question? No? Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, um, there are operating systems that blue screen and there are operating systems that don't. Um, <clears throat> or at least don't frequently. <sighs> so, PHP then. PHP was designed from its outset. Uh, do you guys know what a DSL is? That's DLL, yeah, dynamically linked. I know. Welcome to acronym land. This is the rest of your life. <laughs> DSL is domain specific language. I never would have guessed that. Yeah, I have. So um, you can take programming languages and divide them into two camps, right? You have general purpose programming languages and you have domain-specific programming languages. Java is a general-purpose programming language. If you produce a Java executable, it can do just about anything, right? But it's not really good at any specific thing, right? Except maybe being, like, object-oriented. It's really good at that. Same with Python. Python is a general-purpose programming language. Um, it does not excel at any one task, but it can do a very very broad number of tasks, right? Compare that to domain-specific languages such as JavaScript. JavaScript only puts functionality into web pages. Its domain is very restricted, right? In, it, in that case, it's actually got this unfair monopoly on, uh, on this being the scripting language of the web. But um, JavaScript like, does one thing. Oh, man. Can I say the word well? Well. PHP is in the same category as, um, as JavaScript. It is a domain-specific language. It is designed for one task, and it performs that task well. This is why 
you don't see a bon you, know, you don't see a lot of PHP compilers hanging around that aren't part of XAMPP implementations, right? PHP is only for servers, right? Some people might have like pushed it out a little bit into this or that or the other, but the design intention of it was to add dynamic programming and jump like you know, shall we say, Turing complete programming ability into the server side scripting, right? So that's what it's been designed for from the beginning. That's what it's good at. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, Syntax is similar to C or C++, uh, but that's to say almost nothing because like, we haven't studied a language yet that doesn't have C-based syntax. So like, C is so famous and popular back in the day that like, literally everything that's not like functional or logic languages have C-based syntax. PHP has a large and active community, resulting in a vast collection of libraries, frameworks, and resources available to developers. So, um, PHP kind of um, contradicts itself in a couple of ways. At a basic syntactic level, uh, it's a design, uh, like it's it's a design principle in PHP that. Um, there should be, uh, things shouldn't share functionality. So, for example, plus is overloaded with both numeric addition and string concatenation in languages like Java and JavaScript. In PHP, plus is addition. They have a separate operator for string concatenation. And it is, anybody know? Dot. Very good. It is period. So one might ask, so if it's using dot to mean string concatenation, what does it use for like method access? Does anybody know? So if I was to say, you know, object dot method in PHP, what, what, is, what is the actual operator? Does anybody care to guess? If you're a C programmer, you'll know this. Is it the arrow? Yeah. Yeah. Pointer. Object. It's actually hyphen. Hyphen arrow, yeah. Greater hyphen than, greater than, greater than yeah. method. So. That's how you access methods in That's how you access methods in PHP. Oh. Actually, that's how you access methods. <laughs> So Can't is it the same as C? Well, C, the, the it depends if it's a pointer. If it's like pointing to something else, that's the, uh, that's the one you would use. Yeah, so in C, um, first of all, C doesn't have objects, but it has things that are that collect data called structures or structs. Yeah, so in a, if you have a struct, right, or if you have a pointer to a struct, what this is is structure field access in combination with pointer dereferencing. Um, I'm not going to go through it. If you want me to teach you C programming, come see me after class. I will happily teach C programming to anybody who wants to know, but just not during this class. Um, So, so let's get down to syntax, shall we? Yep. So let's go over some general similarities and differences with the languages that you have studied already. Here are various variable declarations in uh, the three languages we know and the one we don't. You'll notice in PHP, we do not have types specified. 
This is unlike Java. The closest thing we have to PHP variable declaration is Python declaration. You don't require a keyword to define a variable. You just state the name of a variable you've never used before, assign the value, and you're off to the races. Hmm? Um, if you stick two types together in a variable declaration, how do you mean? Like, you know how in Python, you like, um, stick, like, say, like, name equals John plus one value, you get, like, John plus one value, right? Oh. As a string, right? Um, yeah, so, essentially, it works everything out based on um, implicit typing rules on the operators you use, right? So if you do something like um, a plus 5, this will bork on an error because a is not numeric. But if you say a dot 5, dot being the string concatenator, it will convert this to a string and then concatenate them. But yeah, um, PHP, like, see, unlike JavaScript, which will try to force something like this and not produce an error, PHP is a bit more free with errors when it's receiving incompatible types to operations. Um, so it's a little bit nicer in that way. Like I like a I like languages that give you a lot of errors, you know? <laughs> like because you know but what precisely. You don't have to like you're you're less likely to stub your toe on implicit stupid rules that they made up. Yes? Have you ever had this happen and see where your header file returns like two hundred errors and it doesn't tell you where it is? <laughs> Just like the whole the whole header file is there. It's like, yeah. I like at that point I was just like I have to restart. I just don't even know what where it went wrong. Yeah, yeah. And like it could even be somewhere like yeah. not even your problem. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I hate C for that very reason. But uh, it's a fun uh, language though. Hmm? It's a fun language though. Yeah. Well, I like I I really I do think like it's like if you want to understand how computers work, that is the language to learn. I agree. Like, the Unix operating system was developed in tandem with the C compiler, yeah. right? So, one, like, like I sometimes joke with students that, like, unit, like, like, because, like, I used to teach C, and people would ask me, what IDE, what, I, what IDE should I use? What IDE should I use? And I'm like, your operating system is the IDE for C. You know? But, you know, people just aren't, like, people are just uncomfortable unless they're in VS Code, you know? Wait, what? Do you use a specific yeah. one, like, uh, like, Neurobame or anything like that? Oh, you, like, when I'm doing stuff? Um, well, I'm, like, using Linux. Um, so, a lot, most of the time, I'm using either Kate or Get. Kate, yeah. Okay. yeah. I've heard those. Yeah. Kate is the uh, is the one for the KDE yeah, project. Okay. What uh? So what distro do you use? Um, for KDE? my work computer, I'm running KDE Neon, and uh, yeah. for my personal computer, it's uh, Mint. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a, a Debian loyalist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. come on. I appreciate how many the gains that like ArchBase has been making over the over the years, but like. Sorry for compatibility. I just I have to be, and I'm not I'm not like I'm not like you know, heavily embedded in the corporate world. So like Red Hat Fedora is also yeah. like, just over there for me. <laughs> uh, Linux, 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 Linux. Um, so anyway, so PHP uses comments in the Java style, that's actually the C style. Furthermore, 
documentation comments in PHP follow the same style as Javadoc documentation comments, which I'm sure all of you are very used to by now. Right? It turns out that uh, the Javadoc comment style is actually um, based on Doxygen, which is a, uh, a system that will document many different languages and not just Java. Um, include, basically, uh, most languages that use C style comments, Doxygen is compatible with. So, um, yeah. Similarly to Python, PHP is an interpreted language. But unlike, uh, unlike JavaScript and unlike, um, well, I guess not unlike JavaScript, unlike Python, in PHP, you have the option to turn the interpreter on and turn the interpreter off, which means that it actually makes sense to be an interpreter, right? Um, so, that means that all of, the, uh, all of the things that are true of interpreted languages are also true of PHP. Variable names in PHP are case sensitive and must be prepended with the dollar sign. Um, it almost goes without saying, but like the other languages, you have your standard suite of standard data types, booleans, integers, floating point numbers, strings, etc., etc., etc. You also have aggregate data types. Um, PHP calls them arrays, um, although they kind of function like lists anyways, but they call them arrays. Do you guys know the difference between lists and arrays? Yeah. No? Yeah. Yeah? Lists can like be... No, in, in general. general. Hmm? Lists can be like anything in, in a collection, but arrays are like a specific uh, type. Okay? Yeah, sort of. Um, okay. Very, very, very brief digression on the difference between lists and arrays, because this is knowledge that you should have. <laughs> So, um, the main difference between lists and arrays is how they are stored in memory. With an array, arrays are statically sized. So, you take a segment of memory, you start it at a particular address, you count out a number of cells, you put numbers in them, And that's an array. A list is different. With a list, each number is a node in a linked structure. A list is actually either a singly or doubly linked list. You'll learn about this in algorithms. So instead of, and uh, I should say, like, your variable points to the first memory cell, right? In a list, you have nodes which are placed at random throughout your memory. Your list variable points to the first element in the list points here, and then this node, each node contains the number and a pointer to the next node in the list. So, 1 points to 2, 2 points to 3, 3 points to 4, 4 points to 5, 5 points to 6, 6 points to 7, and 7 points to nothing. Right? So, the advantage of arrays over lists is that to find any specific index inside, inside of an array, all you have to do is calculate the offset of that cell using the starting address and the size of these cells and how many you want to count over. 
So that's a one-step operation to hit anything in the array. We say that we can perform array access in constant time. So, for example, if I want to access cell, like the cell containing 6, that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So I say 800 plus 5 times the width w, and that, I calculate that, I dereference that address, and boom, I get my 6, right? Also, this is the reason that programming languages use zero, use zero indexing because this is cell with offset 0. This is cell with offset 1. That's why that happens. That, I just, that's, that's why 0 indexing. In a list, if I wanted to access element 5, there's no way of knowing where in memory that cell is located. You have to trace, you have to walk the data structure to find it, right? So, you have to go, okay, one, two, three, four, five. So it takes a number of steps proportional to the length of the data structure. So access is linear time, where here access is constant time. This is faster than that for access. So, why would you ever want to use one of these? Any ideas? Yeah, easily. Yeah, sorry, did you say something? Uh, well, it actually uses a bit more memory because uh, in total because um, it's also saving the pointers, but it uses a less large continuous chunk, which means that the individual nodes are much easier to place in memory, right? You have to imagine, like, if your array is like a million elements, it's difficult to find a million, you know, a million continuous chunks of memory to put that in. But here, you can fit one of those in pretty easily. Right? But how it works is, if, for example, I knew the location where I wanted to add something new, I could just say, you know, element zero, redirect this to here, put a pointer in there, and boom! You can add a new element to the list in constant time. Whereas here, this memory and this memory might already be filled with something. Which means, in the worst case scenario, to add a new element to this array, you must copy it to a new location in memory. Which means that you have to copy each part. Which means that adding a new element is worst case, takes you an amount of time equal to the size of the data, size of the data structure. So it's slow. Adding things is slow in an array, but finding things is fast. For a list, Adding, adding things is fast, but finding things is slow. Question? Does the timing that we're going to be learning about have anything to do with the big O notation? Yes. Um, so in terms of big O, here, access is big O1, access is big O n. Here, access, um, adding is big O n, and adding something is big O1. That's the, that's the big O notation for the operations I just described. But yeah, so um, you all should know the difference between arrays and lists, because that's like important to know. Now, in PHP, they call them arrays, but they behave like lists. So, so they're lists. fun. Yeah. Are just they like, arrays? eh? Are there actual arrays, then, in the, in the Yeah, they're called lists. <laughs> yeah, they're called lists. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure they're doing a list implementation in the back end, but, like, all of their, all of their functions are called, like, array push or array pop. So there's no, like, actual web array data structure that we can access? Or can you, like, access to it hides this from you. It's like, like as opposed to Java, where you've got like arrays, lists, array list, list array, list list array, array list, list array list, you know. Yeah. Um, as opposed to Java, which like gives you way too many options on like, oh, I want a list, but I want it implemented as an array and that kind of thing. Um, it just kind of hides all of this 
from you and you just get like one linear data type and you don't have to think about it too hard. I'm pretty sure in the back end they're doing a list implementation, but you know, probably lists for, for data structures and then arrays for, for strings. If one's continuous oh. and one's not, then could you, is there any way to get the pointer, like where they're stored at of each one, and you could see like in memory if they're separated really far from you? You mean like keep an array to keep track of your list nodes? No, no, just to see if it's like what, if it's actually oh, yeah. a list or an array. Oh, well, I mean, like if you were doing this because, in a like, language normally that you have a variable it. and it's like an integer, you know it's four bytes, so you would anticipate the next one in the array being four bytes away. Right. But if it's yeah. not, then it would be a list, right? I mean, normally like this would be done in a struct. This is native in C, but this would be a struct. Yeah. Right, so. But you could still do like a I mean, list, it doesn't really make sense to do that, but. I, I, I would just not an example, so. Yeah, I would not encourage you to try picking through memory to try to interpret what you find there because that way lies madness. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. Um, cool. Oh, okay. So, PHP supports objects and classes. But it's actually, like for a very long time, it didn't. Actually, I believe up to PHP 5, like version 5, uh, version 5 was where they introduced classes. So most of the PHP programming that you will be doing in this class will not use classes. I am not going to ask you to write your own classes in PHP. Um, you will, we will have to use them because like the modern secure way of doing databases uses what's called the PDO or PHP data object class. But, you know, we just have to use a couple of method calls. It's not that big a deal, you know. But uh, yeah, PHP does classes kind of in the same way that Python does classes. That is to say, poorly. So if you need classes, use a different language. Further, PHP is a weakly typed language. This means that it recognizes a distinction between double equals and triple equals, right? So double equals means in JavaScript, what am I going to do? Is loose comparison? Like yeah, loose comparison, comparing the values, yeah. right? Triple equals in JavaScript means? Sure. Like a yeah, it's strict comparison, so it's comparing value and type, yeah. right? PHP recognizes this distinction, plus in PHP we will actually run into situations where a single function can return one of three different possibilities, which all compare as equal to each other under uh, weak equality, but will compare differently under Strong, equal, uh, strong equality, and you will have to do different things in different cases because those are all different forms of error message, right? And we'll actually get to that relatively quickly, but um, I can hear people preparing to leave. <laughs> Before you do, whatever you're writing notes on, write, weak typing will be on the test. Um, again. Weak typing will be on the test. Okay? Okay, get out of here. <laughs> 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 